good morning everybody uh, today the topic that we are going to discuss is uh, programming style actually we'll discuss two things today one is programming style that is how does one write good quality program the other is program development style so what does one do to come up with a good quality program so this is how does the program code what does it do to make the program code good and here the development style is the, how does one write come up to write a good program we will look at this so first is the programming style the programming style is uh, very important because well written programs have less error because these are easy to understand and uh, also once a failure is found it becomes easy to debug much less time and cost and also maintenance becomes it is important to learn the style aspect especially for the students and all programmers anybody who writes any program the style aspects are very important and uh, mostly will be following these two books elements of programming style and the uh, principle programming and many slides are taken from there and uh, cunningham and pike the practice of uh, programming so this is uh, another book which we are following the elements of programming style uh, by cunningham and plugger so these are basically books written many years back maybe 20 25 years back and uh, if you look in the google you may find the pdf version available to search for it so it's a good idea to read these books uh, other than the slides that we have so the programming style doesn't tell how to write the program whereas the program development style style tells how to write the program whereas the programming style just says that uh, once you know what to write then you write the program in such a way that are, these are re easy to read anybody can read and understand but then the question comes that why is it important for somebody else other than the writer himself author himself to read the code the answer is that in a professional development environment the programmer who has written the code doesn't maintain it maybe he works on a different project and uh, the software life is quite large and uh, maybe other people who never had any thing to do with the program development specific program development team uh, they are asked to maintain and then they are given the code and if any documents are available and they are asked to maintain so the first thing in maintenance is to understand the code to carry out any small changes to make some improvements or to debug the first thing is to understand the code so if the programming style is not followed proper programming style it becomes very very difficult to understand the code so that is the motivation for using a good programming style and today's focus is to first look at the programming style and then we'll look at the program development style so for writing a program good program first thing is that the syntax to be right and uh, the first students who are new to programming appears hard at first but then once they get used to the programming language syntax part is start writing code which has very little syntax errors and then the next thing is to get the logic right for some programs some problems logic may be bit uh, difficult but then with some practice the logic part also can be obtained so we discuss today the programming style assuming that somebody knows how to get the syntax right logic right how does he write the code good quality code such that uh, 
using good style. We will look at several aspects of a good programming style including I mean there are many other points that we will discuss straight forward logic, natural expression, idiomatic language use, meaningful names, formatting, helpful comments, avoiding clever tricks and unusual constructs. But the thing is that once this is um, understood the benefits of this then the specific user of this programming style can develop his own style if it is an individual program. I mean he is writing the code individually and then use across the program consistently because in some part we follow some style and another part of the code follow some other style it becomes difficult to read the code. But of course in a project environment where large number of developers develop a single application in that case consistency across the programmers is important all should follow the same programming style ok. This is just uh, a cartoon which just says uh, what can happen if the programming style is bad? Just look at the programmer here. Is uh, keep in mind that I am self taught. Some code may be a little messy. See, the programmer says, Let me see, I am sure it must be fine. So then he starts looking at the code, says, Oh, this is like being a house built by a child using nothing but hatchet and a picture of a house. So, she is giving her description of how the code looks like, it is like a salad recipe written by a corporate lawyer using a phone autocorrect that only knew excel formula. It is like a like someone took a transcript of a couple arguing at Ikea and uh, made random edits until it compiled without errors. So, the programmer by this time becoming impatient says ok, I will read some style guide and I will follow the style guide next time. Then she says, uh, looks like the output of a Markov board that has been fed bus timetable from a city where the buses cross constantly. So does a burning bus. So basically, hopeless style looks very ugly code. Then the programmer says, uh, whatever, running fine for now. The first thing that we look at is meaningful name because. The experiments conducted on what is the most important aspect of style that helps a programmer understand the code. Many experiments have been conducted and almost all of them agree that meaningful names, identifier names, identifier means the variables, functions, constants and so on. So, the meaningful identifier names, uh, these are the most helpful in understanding a piece of code, even much more helpful than a comment and so on. So, here the variable names are meaningful, the variable names are country is a variable and then the constants are Singapore, short form, Brunei, Poland, etc. So, the code is ok, but then the problem is that as the code is maintained, the comment and the expressions become inconsistent. And then even if we have a meaningful names, it becomes difficult to understand the code. Just look at the next slide. Later, it was uh, decided that to extend the same facility to Italy. So, the develop sorry the maintainer added this one or country equal to Italy, but then forgot to update the comments normally happens in a maintainer's project and then the, ment the comment part becomes totally useless because earlier it could make sense that ok if the country is Singapore, Brunei or Poland then billing time is the call time rather than the off hook time. But now we have expression tells one thing 
and the comment tells another thing and it becomes extremely confusing because next time somebody looks at the code he won't know that uh, this was the one which was added later and they have forgotten to update the comment as you are saying that the variable name the identifier names are most important so first we look at variable name the number of variables can be extremely large just to give an example microsoft excel has more than 65000 variables and some of these are global variables and some of these are local variables so we must have different naming conventions for global and local variables and we will see the reason why we need to have different conventions for global and local variables. So the variable names can be MPH okay it makes sense if it is a local variable M is too small miles per hour large average miles per hour that the red car went is too large I mean a hypothetical variable name is too large and it actually makes difficult for to read the code if you have too many variables like this and also avoid similar names so these are likely to be confused only the small m has become capital M MQH so for global variables we can have descriptive names because uh, use at different places and then uh, we need to understand what are those used for whereas the local variables are used in a small context and therefore this can be the local variable names can be softer names and also if we need too many local variables we can use namespaces so that is blocks basically so inside block the scope of the variable exists so we can have different temporary variables used inside uh, blocks so that name classes can be avoided but this is only when we need too many variables and also we are giving some broad guidelines the specific way somebody names variables can vary but then we will give some general guidelines and hopefully that will so for global variables the variable name can be bit long so the current length of the input queue it is then pending it is a global variable uh, used across different functions or modules then this is okay but just look at the uh, layering difference in understanding uh, when the variable name is too descriptive versus when we write short names so writing local variables using uh, descriptive names long descriptive names may not be good idea just let's look at it so if we say that the element index equal to 0 initialization and the element index is less than number of elements the element index plus plus so this is the for loop and element array the element index equal to the element index so the same thing is written here for i equal to 0 i less than n lms i plus plus lm i equal to i so it's easy to see that this code can be easily understood and maintained we will have less bugs here even if we write some other variable name here it becomes hard to make out somebody to read and see the difference becomes very difficult so this can become a buggy code so using descriptive names for local variables may not be a good idea especially for temporary variables we may use just i j etc because those are the accepted local variable and also you have to be consistent whether you use a intermixed or underscore like different words the variable name are separated by a capital letter or by underscore whatever we do it must be consistent either you write num pending so here it is a mixed case letter and here it is the two words are separated by underscore the other conventions to follow is that the for global variables the first letter is capital the rest are small 
whereas for constants all letters are upper case letter these are general guidelines and used across many programmers a good practice a good style to have the constants all constants as capitals all globals start with a capital letter whereas local variables are all small letters with a mixed intermixed caps or using underscores but whatever we do must be consistent now how do we give function names one thing is that the function names can be active verb form which describes what the function does for example search book name or compute something and so on these are verb forms which uh, makes clear that what the function does like we say that compute pay it makes clear that uh, the function will use some expressions and it will take some parameters and compute the pay and also we have to clearly say what parameter it takes and also what value it returns and all important functions must have function header we'll see what is there in the function header and how do we name the different functions and how do we document the parameters that it takes and the return value so functions which uh, return a result normally we use a uh, noun form for that we'll see examples letter but here just one small example is that reserved room is equal to guest num number so if we give the guest number this function should be give the room so we the guest has we want to find out which room has been allotted to the guest we write allotted room is a variable allotted room is equal to reserved room guest name this is okay so when the main thing that we need is one value from the function then we can name the function as a noun whereas if the function is required to perform something like sort an array so we can use it's preferable to use a verb form like sort the array which describes the action that the function these are some okay names for variables so this is a mixed case this is with underscore this is underscore and mixed and this is underscore these are three varieties of naming but then we have to use them consistently if we use mixed must use mixed all across this is mixed with underscore and this is just underscore for different words in the variable name and of course illegal names are flagged by the compiler prevents giving such names but then some names compiler accepts but these are bad style very long names names which are easily confused for example here the two variable names the difference is only between the mixed case and small case and so on so any questions anyone has please write on the chat box and we'll discuss about that and if you are sort of variable names then we can use blocks so that we can reuse uh, variable names and uh, becoming verbose just to have more number of variables is not a good idea so this is another example here so the same thing is written using sort variable names n items front capacity etc and here it is written number of items in queue front of the queue queue capacity and uh, call queue dot queue capacity plus plus so doesn't uh, look it's not a good idea whereas queue dot capacity plus plus that's a better code the next thing that we look at is clarity the simpler the expressions the easier it is somebody to understand if something can be written using simpler expressions we have to use the simpler expression just look at this is a valid code 
in one instruction what we have done is we have assigned y equal to x and the value of this expression not only that it does uh, assign y to x, but this expression returns x, so y is equal to x, y is assigned the value, it is a side effect, but then it returns x and then x equal to x plus 1. So, it becomes difficult for somebody if we have many such expressions in a program code becomes difficult, we could rather have written the simple code y is equal to x, so this one I written here and then x is equal to x plus. Now, let us uh, look at another aspect of the style is how to comment the functions. We had seen the function names, but then we need to comment important functions. For example, we need to have a header which describes uh, what the function does, what are the input parameters and what are the different files it handles, it reads or writes, what are the global variables it uses and similarly describe the output, output is not necessarily the return value, it can also include the files written, global variables changed and so on, those can also be output. So, just look at this function it says that read a character and based upon the character and current DFA state call the appropriate state handling function repeat until end of file. So, this does not tell what the function does, it tells how the function operates. So, somebody trying to understand, he will try to understand that what will this function do and to understand how the function achieves that, you will have to read the code, code comment, variable names and so on that will help to understand how the function does. So, normally the header should be written in such a way that it tells that what is the role of this function, what it achieves rather than how it achieves. Just look at the same thing rewritten says the function reads a program from standard in writes it to standard out with each comment replaced by a single space, reserves the line numbers and it returns 0 if successful and it uh, exits with failure if not. So, this just says what the function does rather than how it achieves DFA state, how does it do a transition on the state etcetera, nothing is there here. So, all good function header should describe what the function does rather than how it does that. So, once in a while we will look at the chat box, see if there are any questions and then we will answer the questions. Let me look at the chat box. Okay. So, there is a question here that uh, is there a ISO IEEE standard for coding style? Unfortunately, no. There is no coding standard as it is. Uh, there are language standards, for example, for embedded literacy and so on. So, these are uh, what are the constructs to use, but how to, what style to use, etcetera, I am not aware of uh, any standards that exist. I think good question, but then uh, my answer is that uh, negative, there is no such standard. So, this is just an example function header. The see here that uh, these are the input parameters and the output. So, all the input parameters and what they mean is written down here. So, y is a list, the components are m groups, value in each component r at y i j and so on. So, each variable and trace is a boolean if it is false or uh, that means 0 gives no tracing information, true gives prints change in max change in parameter etcetera. So, all parameters input parameters must, must be described for a function to be understood and also what is the output produced and it may not be all just parameters, but also 
the globals the files and so on if the function affects those must be written let's see the difference between if we say that now is equal to date dot get time so it is clear that it gets the time okay it's a code from it's a not a c code it's a java c++ code so now it's equal to date dot get time so it is clear that uh, it gets from some structure the current time but suppose we write here date dot hour minute so that's uh, is uh, less understandable then get time and the return value should be unambiguous just see here check octal c it's clear that we are checking whether the value that the parameter is octal similarly is octal is octal is a shorter and a preferred one compared to check octal so is octal it is clear that it will return a boolean 1 0 and it is shorter check octal doesn't really convey that information so is octal is a better name and also all the expressions have to be correct accurate just look at here i think this is uh, given in the cunningham and the pike the initial has defined uh, is octal they wrote was well, something like this that uh, is octal is a macro is octal c it checks if c is greater than 0 and c is less than equal to 8 so there was a mistake already and what they should have written is that uh, c is greater than 0 and c is less than equal to 7 so if it says is octal it should actually compute octal otherwise it will be highly confusing and also wrong similarly just look at this code it says that public boolean in table so one would expect that it uh, says it is in the table or not but just look at the code what it does is that it gets the index of the object and returns j is equal to n table so that is uh, length of the table so if it is equal to length of the table it returns 1 else return j is less than n table so it's highly confusing code looking at the name one should expect that it uh, should return 0 or 1 so what it does doesn't really tally with uh, what is uh, inferred from the name now let's look at the expressions and statements to make the expressions and statements one important thing is indentation how do we indent the expressions and statements so just spend couple of minutes to look at that and uh, when we write expression we should uh, use expression which is a natural form normally people would uh, refer to that expression i mean they would uh, when they read out it should appear a natural way that they are communicating so not look like a synthesized or a transformed natural expression and whenever necessary we should parenthesize to remove ambiguity complex expressions should be broken up into simpler expressions and also normally the expression should not have side effects because that it makes it difficult to understand what's going on the side effect is like a value equal to equal to a plus plus so one is that we are checking whether value is equal to a and then also the side effect we are incrementing a a plus 1 so the first is indentation so all box of the code especially the while statement the block associated with the while statement if statement they should be properly indented so this is uh, just a small example so looking at uh, any uh, statement we know that which block it belongs to this statement belongs to this block and so on so this statement all statement inside belong to this block and so on 
So, vertical alignment of the block markers is important. So, this is the block marker if it starts here and here it becomes easy to find all the statements that are inside this block. Similarly, inside this block, if block, we know that these two are there and so on. So, a vertical alignment of the or same nesting level, same level of nesting makes it easy to determine which statement belongs to which block. And also, we need to indent to show the structure. For example, just look at this code. There is a null statement here and we just wrote semicolon here. But then, it may be a good idea to write the semicolon, say that this indicates that there is a null state, otherwise it can be missed and somebody may confuse that it will execute. So, this explicitly shows that the statement to be executed for the for is a null state. Similarly, we will see about idioms slightly more detail, but here just see we are using idioms here. So, for the same code, same code we have just written here n plus plus n less than 100 and n plus plus. So, that is the action part and field n equal to 0. zero. So, this is uh, we will see the idioms and see that if the code is written this form it becomes easier to understand. So, this code just see here somebody has written here and we do not know that whether this belongs to this statement is the if block actually it uh, what about this and does not align with this does this all this belong to the if block we should have written indented properly this one indented properly. So, this we know that all statements here belong to the if these two belong to the while and this is the block end for the even when we uh, write tabular information like we are initializing a two dimensional array. If we align it like a table becomes easier to understand. So, there are 5 here we have written 5 and the, the 3 rows here and we have written 3 rows that becomes easier to understand how the line factors array would. and also if the code has many parts for example, let us say this is the declaration part and uh, this is the initialization part and then the file handling part and so on. It is a good idea to give spaces between them between the different parts. It uh, helps in understanding the code and we should use the natural form of the expression. So, that is the way we speak the expression should correspond to that. We should not use the negation or a complicated form or a compiler short circuit. Somebody can use a short circuit form of this and write and may be equivalent to this expression, but then it becomes extremely hard to understand what it does. Just look at here, we have used a negative logic here. I mean, we are uh, let us try to read this. If not block id is less than blocks or not block id greater than on blocks. We could have re rewritten it that if block id is greater than or equal to active blocks or block id is less than on blocks. So, it becomes much easier to understand the what we are trying to achieve in the expression. We can come up with equivalent expression using the de Morgan's law. I mean they are basically Okay, this is not de Morgan's, but then we can form a de Morgan's law and uh, make it unnatural. What we normally perceive the expression does should be written rather than we write that R is not equal to N and R is not equal to capital N. This becomes straightforward and understood. Whereas, if we use the de Morgan's law and find the equivalent and write not r is equal to n or r is equal to n just see how hard it becomes to understand. So, we must use the natural form of the expressions the way normally we convey speak 
or read should be correspond to that. And wherever there are chances of confusion, must use brackets, parentheses. Let us say we had x and mask equal to b. So, becomes a bit difficult for somebody to understand that what really happens. But if we give a bracket, then it is clear that first this is computed and then com compared with. And similar is here. So, see this expression leap year is equal to y mod 4, which is equal to. So, basically, finding out whether y is a leap year or not. So, we have given this conditional, it will return a true or false. So, it is divisible by 4 that is this one and it is not a 100 year or it is divisible by 400. But then it becomes much easier if we give the parenthesis here and if we have a complex expression like this makes it hard to somebody to understand the code. Programmer should actually break up into simpler expressions. So, this is not a good idea we should have written here equivalent actually. So, this is a ternary operation just look at here n minus m is checked and if it is true then this is assigned this is the value that taken otherwise this value is taken. So, we could have written if 2 in k is less than ok this is the expression 2 into k minus n minus m. So, this is the expression which is checked. And then either this value is taken or this value is taken depending on the expression turns out to be true or false. The same thing we could have written here which is clear if uh, 2 into k is less than n minus m then we assign x p is equal to c k plus 1 or if that is false we take the other value and assign it to x p. So, d k minus 1 d k minus minus assigned to x p and then we say that star x plus equal to star x p. So, it becomes clear now even the code is slightly lengthy, but this is a very cryptic code it would take hours for somebody to understand and still he may not understand it properly. So, the logic what is happening here is obvious here becomes easy for somebody to understand and also complex expressions like this if uh, the month is January, February, March, April, etcetera. Just see we have written a very long expression. If we could have written it in a nice format, it would make it much easier to read. It is evident by just looking at these two expressions. Uh, Let us see if there are any questions or comments in the chat box. Okay. So, there is a uh, question, Okay, many questions actually. One question is what is code obfuscation? Obfuscation means to really make it uh, difficult to understand the meaning. So, something which is the meaning is clear, if that is a clear code, a simple clear somebody can understand. You write obfuscation that means you do not want somebody to understand the code. So, maybe for various reasons maybe that uh, the programmer really wanted to write a code where he took pride in making the code hard for somebody to read and they will finally come to him and ask uh, please uh, do something about the code please help us debug and so on so he wants to have uh, so that he can only handle the code so intellectually superior so that is one reason uh, otherwise somebody may obfuscate the code to hide a trojan in the code, he has written something that only he can understand and uh, he knows hidden a functionality there where he can invoke it by obfuscating the code. The others who are reviewing etcetera, they miss that point and only he understands and he can later fire that function and do something. So, there may be different reasons why somebody writes a obfuscated code. Now, let us look at the other question, identifier same as a variable. So, the next question is from 
cube a that is uh, is identifier same as a variable variable is identifier yes but then all identifiers are not variables identifier has a much larger meaning function names are also identifiers constant names are also identifiers and so on so variable names are identifiers but all identifiers are not variable names they can be function names names of constants and so on i hope that uh, clears the question now next question is from kushwan what is the difference between code walk through and code inspection okay so code review is two types one is code walk through and code inspection in code review the team members set up team members they check whether a code has good style and also if it has bugs so there are two types of code review one is code inspection and code walk through in code walk through the reviewers they take some test cases or input values and see how it is being processed by the code so the main reason main idea in code walk through is to check whether the code is logically correct will it give correct output or are there logic mistakes that is the main objective of code inspection sorry code walk through whereas code inspection is normally done against a checklist they don't take a test case and walk through the code but they have a checklist maybe the style guides how the variables are named how are the constants named is the header properly written are the local variables proper so a code inspection uh, has is done against a checklist and some part of the checklist can be program style programming style aspects the other can be that uh, is the functions sort enough and uh, some known errors they can check for example array index out, out of bounds so the checklist may say that normally our programs programmers have done mistakes in array index handling so one of the checklist program in, in code inspection can be array index bound check array index bound so that checklist they will inspect the code so i hope the answer is clear that there are two types of code reviews one is code walk through where we look at the correctness correct computation of the function the other aspect the other type of review is code inspection the code inspection is done against a checklist the checklist can be 20 30 items and some of the items can be programming style and the other items can be the mistakes normally committed by the other programmers for example forgetting to initialize variables so that may be one element in the checklist so the review team will see if the variables have been properly initialized i hope that clarifies the question now let me look at the other question is variable definition is the same as initialization no not really initialization is done separately so of course in the variable definition we can do the initialization but normally they are two separate things now next question is when to use a type def and when to use macro actually the purpose of type def is to have a new data type for example we need a student data type so we'll use type def student 
and maybe the student structure we define. So, by type def we get a new data type normally int float car etcetera these are data types and each data type we can instantiate like int i float f double d etcetera. So, once we define a new data type we can also instantiate them easily. So, if we need instances of let us say student structure it becomes easy to define a new data type student and then I we write student s1, s2, s3, etc. So, the purpose of data type is to have a new sorry the purpose of type def is to have a new data type the program whereas, the purpose of macro is to reuse some code. So, you make some part of the code as a macro and then it becomes a text substitution. So, we give a single name to a code part, the code part we give a new we give a name and wherever the compiler will find that name it will substitute that code part. We will be discussing about the macros a little later. So, the macro question will become clearer as we proceed, but uh, as I said that the type def the purpose is to create an new data type and macro the purpose is to reuse code. I mean just like a function we call to reuse code, but then the function call has overhead whereas, a macro is done by text substitution before compilation and therefore, the overheads are less we, we have some discussion coming up on the macros. So, the next question is how are white faces handled in C? White faces are ignored by the C compiler if they are given the proper space the proper places. We cannot use white spaces uh, in between a variable name, but then between two variable names white spaces are given the white spaces are stripped by the compiler. The white spaces are for the reader of the code human reader of the code whereas as far as the compiler and machine the computer they do not need white spaces they just strip out and then have a compact machine code generated. So, the white space is eliminated by the compiler whereas, these are used by the human reader it helps them if there are white spaces are given properly. I hope that answers the question. Now, the next question is when memory is reserved at the variable declaration or initialization. See when you declare a variable int i memory is reserved and the name of that memory is i, but then if it is a global variable the memory can be containing junk until it is initialized whereas local variables the memory is reserved on the stack global variables on the heap local variables on the stack and these are initialized to 0 local variables initialized to 0 global variables can have junk values until they are initialized. So, initialization does not do memory allocation the memory is reserved when we declare. So, is instance same as an object yes yes the answer to the answer the answer to the question is yes an instance is a object, but an instance can be a primitive type also for example, int i i is a instance of integer, but then i is not object it is a primitive type whereas, if we have a class and we instant instance it we get object. Now, the next question is what is the difference between rand and srand ok. So, these are two library functions rand and srand you can just uh, in a unix machine you can give man rand and man srand and uh, c 
what how they differ but then all the random number generators are pseudo random generators so rand does not take a seed whereas srand takes a seed so both are pseudo random generators but then rand if you use it uses the same seed each time so rand can predictable numbers can be there but srand it takes a seed and you can you can make different calls to the random with different seed values to make it more random but all these are pseudo random number generators you can look at more details on rand and srand in the manual of unix man rand man srand etc so now let's look at the next question okay the next question is uh, i mean it's more into the syntax and so on friend function etc so i don't think that we will you know we are looking at the style aspects let's not diverge too much then so we will not be able to do any justice for what we are sitting here largely the slides will remain uncovered so friend function etc will not answer why do certain organizations have their own programming styles okay so some organizations maybe that uh, they have uh, deal with problems where there are large number of variables so they will have some style or some applications where the expressions are extremely long let's say control applications so they will have their own style so depending on the applications and also depending on the preference of the team the coding standards can differ so next question whether it is possible to reduce the number of lines of code by following recommended programming styles okay see the question is that whether it is possible to reduce lines of code by using the style see i don't know why we should reduce the line of code because finally the code what is important is that whether it is maintainable whether we can debug it so line sub code is a different concern if a long program which is 1000 line code is much more maintainable and does the same thing as another 500 line code or 200 line code which is very cryptic and difficult to debug maintain then obviously you should go for the long program and uh, therefore optimizing the lines of code is not the objective of the style programming style okay next question can we code graphs in c language and how uh, okay so this is a very standard question that how can graphs be coded in a c program and uh, i think almost every c book discusses it that there are two main approaches so you can have linked list or a array to the edges and node connectivity either represent as a array which node is connected to which other nodes or you have a linked list representation where you say which nodes are connected to which other nodes uh, so these are this is a standard question just look up on the book any c programming book will be able to tell you that how are graphs represented in a c program and the process what is the difference between increment and or decrement operator with suffix and prefix so maybe plus plus i and i plus plus so those are the prefix and suffix increment operator so if it is a prefix operator plus plus i and used in expression then first i is incremented in a prefix first i is incremented then the incremented value is used in the expression whereas if it is a suffix i plus plus then the i value as it is used in the expression and then after that the i gets incremented again a very standard question so next question is how to display output in a tabular tabular form in c language like a student record okay so see the thing is that c language if you want to use a text interface you have to use the format statement in 
printer the format block the formats like let's say i want to print all integers in size 15 so i give percentage 15 d or i want to print all float numbers with uh, two decimal points and the integer part so i give percentage f 10.2 or something like that so the format statements can help in producing tabular output uh, just look up because we have to basically every variable that we print we assign specific width so that the table gets well formed. Now, next question Is there a format specifier for accuracy like 0.2f, 0.3f? Then, how to get desired accuracy in output yeah it is the available that's what i said you can write 0.2 f 0.3 f okay names next question is namespace see namespace is a block so it is the scope a namespace is the scope for which the variable is valid So, the namespace for a variable is the block in which it is defined outside the block it is not valid. So, if we have multiple blocks we have multiple namespaces and then it becomes easier for us to reuse the variable name. Now, next question. So, the next question is execution of the procedure okay uh, execution procedure of printf percentage d percentage d a plus plus a plus plus okay see um, the question that you have asked is compiler dependent because you have used two times a plus plus in printf so okay a okay one is prefix another is suffix so the result is unpredictable in general but then for a specific compiler you can try run the code and see what it prints but that's not a general answer that won't become a general answer a different compiler can give a different answer and some compilers can give a compilation error on your code next question how array is different from linked list this though we had in the previous lecture please look at the previous session array and so now let us proceed we have been answering questions for some time now let us proceed and then again we will come back to the chat and see what are the questions so let us proceed with the what we are doing so we are saying that the expressions have to be clear if this is the expression somebody has written then it becomes hard to make out what is exactly achieved but the same thing can be done with very simple set of statement so just see here what is happening is that the rotate right bit of by 3 and then rotate left so what really it does is that 3 least significant bits it makes 0 rotates it 3 to the right and then rotates back and then bit of minus those three bits. So basically, it is see, this part of the code bit of minus bit of right shift three bits and then left shift three. So this part is actually just taking out the last three bits, just making the last three bits zero. And then the sub key is rotated by the value obtained after stripping of the last three bits or making the last three bits zero. So, the same thing we could have achieved by bit of bit level and of octal 7 and then we rotated the sub key. So, 
you could have even used the short form sub key rotate equal to bit of and 0 7. So, just see here the logic that is used complex for anybody to understand. Similarly, the ternary operators, this is another place of confusion in C language if we do not use it properly. The typical use of a ternary operator like this that if a greater than b is true then a or b is to use in ex in expressions like a printf in a statement like a printf or somewhere we just uh, need to either print a blank or s depending on whether n is equal to 1 and so on. So, it makes it the code elegant and short rather than having a code which is having several if and the print is repeated across and so on. So, this is the right place for using the ternary operator, but the ternary operator can be misused to make the program extremely confusing. So, that we must be avoid, we have we should have clear code. So, this is uh, another one, just see the ternary operator is misused here. So, it is hard to read this, but what exactly this achieves, see there are two ternary operators actually, one ternary operator inside another ternary operator. So, it becomes hard to find out what is happening, but the equivalence would just see here. If LC or RC is equal to 0, then child is equal to 0. Else, if LC is equal to 0, then RC, then RC or LC. So, this code is much easier to understand than deciphering this embedded ternary operators and the result is assigned to the child. So, this is another classical example that uh, to which one does not equal to UF apply, does this have higher priority or this etcetera. So, the programmer who is trying to understand the code. Uh, can get confused and spend lot of time finding out what is happening here. But if we give a bracket here, it becomes clear that T is assigned get care and then that is compared with UA. In expressions, it is easy to write code which has side effect and unless th there is a real reason why we need the side effect, it is not a good idea to use. So, we are writing the code string i plus plus equal to string i plus plus equal to blank. Very bad code, we could have written here string i plus plus equal to blank. So, string i is assigned blank and then i value incremented prepares for the next one and here the string i plus 1 is assigned blank and then again i is incremented. Similarly, unless there is a real reason why we need a side effect inside a expression, it is not a good idea to have side effect here. What we really want is array i is equal to i and then after that we need i plus plus. So, it is better to write separately, it becomes easier to understand rather than having side effect inside an expression and many times side effect may not work actually. Just look at this code. So, here what we really want is that we want to scan f two integers, one is here and the other is profit and then see here year is taken as argument. So, the same year is supposed to the programmer wants the same year to be used here after it is scanned. But then one thing we must remember that this is wrong basically because before the function scanf is called the parameters are first evaluated. So, the address of year is computed and profit year address is computed and the value of year that existed before that is used not this year. If we really wanted to have this year which is read to be used as a index for the profit, then we should have used these two scanf year and scanf profit. Now, let us look at the consistency and idiom part. Consistency is consistent throughout the code we have to use consistent naming indentation and also we have to use idioms for consistency. Idioms actually yield consistency and also idioms help 
understand the code. Let us look at idiom part in the next slide. And also, if we have multi way decision, like uh, the switch statement has its shortcomings, can not use it in many places. And then we use a if else if block nested, I mean, uh, uh, set of if else if else for multi way decision. But then we must use else if rather than just using if else, if else, etc. We will see this. Have one or two slides on this. So, let us look at the idiom part. Okay, before that, we had already seen the indentation style. Unless a proper indentation becomes difficult to know which statement belongs to which block. So, this is another example. Like proper indentation we can make out here we this is a better code compared to this previous one so here we are finding if the month is february and the year is a multiple of 4 and day is 29 and if day is 29 then legal is false so it's invalid february 8 else if date is so that is it is not a leap year then if the date is 28 then it becomes illegal so the same thing we could have done see here we just uh, given proper brackets here to make it more readable we have given brackets here so after uh, finding a leap year what is the code that is getting executed here and this is a better style of writing the program that we have used inside this block a temporary variable say n day and then we have initialized n day to 18 28 and then we are changing n day to 29 if it is a leap year and then we are just one if statement we are checking if the day so both the cases whether it is a leap year or other years just having checking the day end day we are able to make out whether it is a uh, illegal day. Now, let us look at the idioms. So, just asking this question that what is a idiom? The school level grammar question that what is a idiom? If you go back to your school level grammar book and take out the chapter phrases, idioms, you will find that an idiom is a group of word whose meaning is different from what is inferred or what is denoted by the exact uh, meanings of the individual word. So, an idiom is a group of words whose meaning is different from what can be inferred from the individual words. Just to give an example of an idiom in the English grammar book is it is raining cats and dogs. So, if you look at the individual words that is not true, you are trying to denote or the actual meaning of the idiom is that it is raining very heavily, it is not really raining actual cats and dogs. So, that is an example of a idiom that uh, the group of words is used as it is to mean something. And that is a conventional use of those set of words. For example, you cannot say that it is raining mouse and elephant. Okay, that uh, nobody will understand. That is not the idiom. The idiom is it is raining cats and dogs. So, those specific words are used in that exact sequence. And then everybody understands that what you mean. So, every language has its idiom including C, C++, Java, etc. And those are the conventional use. Everybody makes use of that and the meaning is instantly understood if you use idioms. Let us look at some example. Let us say you want to initialize the elements of an array with uh, 1. There are various ways you can write the code. For example, you can write a while loop 
i equal to 0 while i less than n minus 1 array i plus plus 1.0. You can use a for loop like this i equal to 0 i less than n array i plus plus 1 or you can write for i equal to n minus minus i greater than equal to 0 array i equal to 1 for 0. But then the C idiom everybody uses is this one or i equal to 0 i less than n i plus plus array i equal to 1.0. So, if this code is written everybody in instantly understands what is meant and even it becomes easy to find if there is a mistake in the conditionals here etcetera. So, here somebody writes i less than n minus 1 or i less than equal to n and so on it becomes difficult to debug whereas this code is easily understood because it is a C idiom. The C has uh, several large number of idioms which are the common use for those constructs for specific programming tasks. We have commonly accepted constructs which is for accessing the individual elements of an array the for loop is used for i equal to 0 i less than n i plus plus. So, similarly, we look at few more idioms. So, wherever possible we must use idioms because it makes it easy for somebody to understand the code and also it builds consistency in the code. So, these are some other idioms. So, this is the idiom for traversing the linked list pointer equal to list initialize until the pointer does not become null p is equal to p next. So, traverse the list and then do the operations here like print a list or whatever. And these are the idioms for infinite loop. So, similarly, there are several other idioms and also when we use idiom we must lay out the code as uh, everybody does that makes it easier for somebody to understand the code. Actually the same code here just see how the programmer has written makes it hard to understand the code and also that looking at a screen part of this may appear on one screen the next part may go to another screen or if you are looking at a printout one part may appear in one page the other part in other page becomes extremely difficult to understand. But the normal idiom is this one a p equal to a r r a p less than a r r plus 128 a p plus plus star a p equal to 0. So, this is the one preferred we must use idioms wherever possible this is another idiom c idiom this is to get character from a stream until we have end of file. So, c equal to get care not equal to your put care c. But if you write it like this, this is not a idiom and it can be foggy. For example, should the first character be red is the what if the first character is uf and so on. So, this code is not preferred the idiom not only it helps somebody to understand the code, but also it is less prone to errors because idioms are known to everybody they can write the code straight without really having errors in them. So, again the idiom for for unless we use the for it becomes difficult to detect the error just see here we are allocating memory size of int and number of members and then if we write here i equal to 0 i less than equal to number of members i plus plus then we have problem here because uh, we have uh, one extra array index that we are accessing and that is array index out of bound error because we have allocated only n member. So, if we use the proper C idiom i equal to 0 i less than n mem then we there would not be any error otherwise there is a scope of error. So, idioms prevent errors 
other example here. So this is a buffer 256 and then we allocate uh, allocated memory of size uh, buffer and then a string copied buffer to P and then we remembered that there is an extra character for backslash 0 and we wrote this but then this is the idiom and then we should check the return value for malloc this is not the idiom so if you know the idioms then we not only somebody else can understand but it becomes less error prone see this is a multi way decision different conditions are taken and decisions are different conditions are checked and decisions are taken. But then the meaning of this code is hardly coming out that which decision leads to which code. But just look at the same code rewritten in the else if format. So here we have written in the if else format. But then let us look at the else if format the same code. So here the decisions are clear that if this is condition holds then this is the action, if this condition holds then this is the action and so on. So an else if for multi way decisions is preferable and also in a switch if we write fall through code without breaks then we better comment that out so that the why we need specific and the programmers idea that he intentionally left the break and it falls through becomes clear that he intended fall through. So this is another example of else if so just see here actions corresponding to the specific decisions are clear now just asking this question give one example of idiom in C. And what is the advantage of using idioms? What is the use of uh, idioms in programming? And give one example of a idiom in C language. Okay, we already discussed as if you can recollect that idioms help others to understand the code and also it makes programs less error. And one example, the for example, is uh, very popular most everybody uses array access individual array element access for a for loop already discussed about that. Now let us look at the macro a macro is a single instruction which expands into a set of instruction during compilation. So basically the compiler performs text substitution. So we have a block of code or set of instructions which have given a single name and that is the macro and the compiler before compilation carries out substitution text substitution. So wherever that macro name appears it places that set of code those place at, at those locations. So this process is called as macro expansion many uses of macro are there we we'll see couple of uses one of the use is to define constant. So define pi is 3.14. So here the main motive behind using the macro is that uh, makes the code more readable. We will use pi in the source code, but when the program compiles actually substitute 3.14. So the magic number of 3.14 will be not there when the programmer reads it will be pi. But during compilation it will become 3.14. But then the question comes is that why not use constant float pi 3.14 ok. If we use constant float 3. Point pi 3.14 then possibly we need some memory overhead and here the C it is a text substitution there is no memory overhead. But then we will see that uh, actually constant float pi 3.14 is preferable to macro. The reason is that even though 
macro does not take memory space and it is text substitution but then it is error prone we'll see how the macros become error prone and also type checking etc is a problem we will we'll look at those aspects and another reason other than the constant the other reason is function macros we we'll look at the function macros something like this has defined clear area r is this code so works something like a function you could have even written a function circle area r function code but the advantage of the function macro is uh, to save the overhead of a function call because this is done as a text substitution of course the executable will become longer but then it will save the overhead of a function call again we will see that function macros are not a good idea let us look at those aspects so the main idea why macros are used is that it enhances the execution speed of the program but then it can make the program error prone suffer from name classing decrease maintainability now let us look at these aspects so this is a macro for finding the maximum of two numbers so this is a function macro works something like a function and takes two arguments x y and then the return of the max is the larger of the two parameters so if we just give max 5 3 works great and it returns 5 if we give max 6 minus 1 4 minus 1 also works great returns the correct value but if you give something like this max a b plus plus so then just see here that during the macro expansion this code is substituted for the macro and then this is the code which actually is uh, generated by the compiler pre-processing a greater than b plus plus a or b plus so just see here the b plus plus has a side effect of incrementing b now that side effect is twice applied so b will become plus 2 which is not intended and it will be a bug which is hard to make out by just looking at the max macro call so we just saw that function macros are a fragment of code which has been given name and then the compiler substitutes the parameters appropriately in the function macro and the code is replaced but the general suggestion is that avoid function macros and these are error prone not maintainable the only advantage of the function macros is that they are supposed to make the program run faster by avoiding the function call overhead but then c++ etc they have inline functions they are similar to macros but then they are overcome they overcome the problems of the macros but if we really have to use macros function macros then we must properly parenthesize now let's see how function macros can create error some more example and how do we avoid that so let's see this function macro that has defined upper c so this is a function macro tech c the argument and then returns whether it is an uppercase or not and lies between capital A and Z. So works well in some cases, but then if we give an argument get care, then get care will get multiple times called C equal to get care not work. I mean it will be error. Similarly, many examples where it can lead to problem like we have defined a function macro round to int and then unless we give bracket properly it can lead to error similarly okay this is just one example use of that will not spend time here so just look at another simple example of error here square 
is x into x square x is x into x. Now, this is a function macro we we'll compute the square of x, but then if we use it 1 by square x the preprocessor will generate this code 1 by x into x and definitely we did not intend this we wanted 1 by x square. So, what it will become 1 by x into x which is basically 1. The way to avoid this would have been to properly parenthesize the square x. So, now please answer this quiz. What is the pitfall of using a function macro such as max a b a less than b greater return b or a. So, give an example or identify the pitfalls of using this. So, this is for you to work out. Let us look at if there are any questions on the chat box. Okay. One question is that why macros do not have data types. Okay. Macro can work because it is a text substitution. It can work for any argument. A can be int, it can be float, it can be double. So, it is just a substitution of the text and the depending on where we have substituted. It can handle float, int, etcetera. So, it, because it is a text substitution, we do not have types associated with macro and that can create problem actually in some situation, example situation. Okay. So, there is another question that the difference between a macro function and a inline function. So, we have some examples coming out, coming up actually and the main difference is that in macro we do not do type checking, type, type checking we just substitute the function the macro body whereas, in the inline function we have type checking and the other problems of the macros are over, overcome we will have a look at. So, the next question is uh, if a variable has multiple prefix, postfix, decrement operators then how do we infer it? How do we solve it? Okay, so, first thing is that based on the style that we are discussing, we will recommend that please do not use such expressions. I think your expression looks very awkward. First thing is you should not use that expression and as I already said that we have a mixture of prefix and postfix, then it becomes compiler dependent. These are side effects a plus 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 b these are when we use in expressions these have side effect of generating then incrementing the variable and normally avoidable and specially the complex ones multiple a plus plus multiple and some a plus plus some a minus minus etc that is definitely avoidable. So, let us uh, proceed that is all the chats uh, questions on the chat box. Let us proceed. So, this we had discussed some examples please look up. Okay, this is the answer that we are giving here that one example is that if we use a plus plus b plus plus then both a and b a or b will be incremented twice. So, please uh, convince yourself that only one of that will get incremented twice because depending on this condition. So, first it will be used here a plus plus then b plus plus. So, they are incremented once here and any one of these will execute therefore, one of that will get incremented twice the other one is ok once. So, next style aspect that we will consider are magic numbers. If we use constant values inside the program for somebody becomes hard to make out why you use those constants. For example, if we had written one line of code is x equal to 12 into d. So, then somebody reading the code he will be wondering why did you use 12 is it uh, the number of months in a year or is it uh, number of eggs that are available in dozen. So, it becomes highly confusing that in what context you have used. Similarly, 
you just multiply it suddenly 6.672 10 to the power minus 11 then somebody will wonder what are you doing here but if you had a macro uh, macro or a constant called as uh, universal gravitational constant then the expression becomes clearer so magic numbers to be avoided either use macros which the compiler strips and then substitutes the actual values for them but for the reader the macros make it uh, easy to read but then this can lead to macros we have to be careful that they may lead to syntax errors so we can define meaningful names by using macros output buffer size input buffer size rather than using magic numbers like 20 we use input mode input buffer size so that somebody reading the program gets a clear name so just see here it's about generating an histogram and this code if you try to go through it will be hard to go through because it has many magic numbers inside it like 27 3 21 etc why did you write 23 2 here etc but then we use macros by using okay this is names this is not macro this is name through enumerate enumeration in c and then we use those enumerated values here and just see try to read this code you will see that you are able to understand this much better so height label row minimum column etc these are much more understandable than numbers like 23 2 etc and as i was saying that it's a good idea to define numbers like 24 etc as constants rather than macros the main problem is that macros are error prone and don't do type checking and therefore if you use macros you have to be extremely careful otherwise there can in introduce errors and it's preferable to use constant int even though it takes a memory space but then nowadays in computers few bytes of memory hardly matter this code is much less readable because there are magic numbers like 65 90 etc so we should not use integer constants like 65 90 we should use character constants like single quote a single quote z etc similarly we should use any inbuilt functions for finding the size of different variables or structures or objects like size of buff rather than writing here 30 or 100 1024 so it's good to use the size of function length etc size of array rather than writing magic numbers and that becomes less maintainable if we write the magic number now let's look at the commenting aspects so the comment should actually help the person great get some crucial ideas about the code we should not just write comments just because we have to write several lines of comment and we should not write the ones that are obviously inferred from the code and also the comments are the hazard that if the comments are not updated as the program changes this can really create problem and confuse so if we write obvious things then it uh, actually makes the code less readable so we have written zero count plus plus obvious that zero count is incremented and then we write here increment zero count zero entry counter it hardly helps actually obscures the understanding of the overall code if we have too many of such stuff appearing in the code you see here no additional information is obtained by somebody reading the comment end of file left parenthesis etc it just a distraction and too many of that can make it hard to read the code and one thing that we must do is comment the global variables because these are defined somewhere and used elsewhere so somebody must understand 
is 12. Whereas temporary variables, etc., local variables, you need not. So the functions and global data must be commented. Somebody has to understand the global data context in which it is used. Already seen that, not spend time here. And if the code is already bad, writing elaborate comments also may not help. We have to rewrite the code. So, this is just one example that we are returning not result, etc. So, what does somebody infer by looking at the code, even if we write a comment here, comment like this, return false, etc., does not help because once it comes here, return not result, confusing. We should have rewritten the code return match found. So, the same code is rewritten and it is much more understandable even without the comment. If the comments contradict what is happening in the code that really confuses. So, we will not go into the details of this code just running short of time. So, similar example here the comment is something and the code is doing something else. So, the code should if we have a comment at all the code should be doing exactly what is written on the comment. So, here just see the comment is not good string comparison routine returns minus 1 if S1 is above S2 in ascending order list 0 is equal 1 if S1 below S2. So, it is highly confusing comment what do you mean by S1 is above S2 in ascending order list you could have written a very short comment like this which could have been much more helpful in understanding return 0 if S1 is less than S2, 0 if S1 greater than S2 etc. So, this is a much understandable code, much understandable comment. Now, let us see the program development style. So, we we'll look at two aspects top down design and successive refinement. Both top down and successive refinement have similar theme which is very much different or just the opposite of the bottom up design. In bottom up design you take parts design it and then put them together. Just let us look at what happens if a painter is painting and then he paints different parts of the painting may be different painters paint and then put them together it is unlikely to produce a good picture. The similar is the case with a program we should actually use top down programming where we first define what is the sketch of the solution with minimal detail and then each of the elements in the sketch we, re, we refine them further and then make this work and then the entire thing falls into place. Like a painter, he gives initial overall sketch that what will be where and so on and then the individual aspects he handles and gets a good picture like this. Similar theme is for stepwise refinement, but he, here it is more systematic. So, here in each step the problem is decomposed into a set of problems or there can be a selection like if condition then P1 else P2 or it can be a iteration. So, it is not only simple decomposition as uh, suggested by a top down approach, but here stepwise refinement we have three primitives one is decomposition, the other is if then, the other is do while. So, this is an example of a stepwise refinement in first step we just identify the problem in step 2 we said that three problems need to be solved and then we said P1 to be solved and then for P2 we said that P2.1, 2.2 etc. have to be repeated and then used if, while etc. So, this is a step wise refinement example. So, now we are almost at the end of or 2 hours, so I'll actually exceeded 2 hours. So, in conclusion, let me say that we have to learn the style aspect and then just learning is not enough, we have to make 
the style a habit so that whenever we write programs automatically we use good style. So we will stop here and if you have any doubts, suggestions, clarifications please feel free to send me an email and we will read that and answer the best that is uh, can help you. Thank you very much.